Amen. Amen. Come on, open your Bible. You guys should automatically, your Bible should just flip to this verse. We've been in it for the last four weeks. Matthew 5, verse 13. If, you're, uh, if today's your first day here, we've been in a series called Be Salty. Somebody say, Be Salty. It's based off of Matthew 5, verse 13. If you don't have your Bible, we'll show it behind me. It says, you are the salt of the earth. You are. I am. We are. We are the salt of the earth. But if, somebody shout, but if. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be, how can it be made salty again? For you see, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot. Whew, that's tough. But we've been talking about when our relationship and our heart and who we are is connected to the salty one, Jesus himself, we won't lose that saltiness, amen? In fact, we'll just become more salty or saltier. And so last week, if you recall, uh, I did a, um, I kicked things off and I talked about uh, what I believe is the saltiest character in the Bible. Anybody remember who it was? Saul. Saul, I believe, was the, in the New Testament, Saul, was the, the saltiest character in the Bible. Uh, the short version of what I shared last week was, um, uh, was really the title of the message was called All In. If you think about the life of Saul before Christ or before being, con before being converted to Christ on the Damascus Road experience, the, the, uh, what Mark saw was he was all in. He was just all in for the wrong things. <laughs> he was well-educated, well-financed, great family, came up through great, um, great education. He was well-educated. He, he had all the markings of a very, very successful religious guy. And then he took it one step further, if you remember. He was, um, he was a murderer. He sat there and watched Men and women get slaughtered, get stoned. And the Bible says in the case of Stephen, one of the first disciples to get martyred because of his faith. He sat there and watched the very, uh, the very um, man that was preaching the gospel, sharing the good news about Jesus. He sat there and watched him get stoned to death. That was Saul. He was salty and not good. He was a bad dude. He was jacked up on the inside, but he had a, he had a, a religious, he had a, um, he had a steadiness, he had a, he had a zeal, the Bible says, for, for all things about the law. And he intended to, um, he intended to, to enforce the law. And that's what took him down that dark road. But some may say, but God. <laughs> oh, but God. But God had different plans for this man. Aren't you thankful for different plans? Aren't you thankful that God had different plans for you before you met, even before you met Christ? Aren't you thankful that God had a higher purpose for Paul? And so on that Damascus road, if you remember in the, in the book of Acts, we talked about it. He encountered, he encountered Jesus himself. Jesus spoke to him and said, Saul, what are you doing? Why are you persecuting me? And it was that moment, if you remember, Jesus, boom, struck him blind. Struck him blind. Scales filled his eyes. Couldn't see a thing. Right there on that road. Knocked him to his knees. The suddenly a life hit that man. I don't know about you, but I've just been chewing on that word Suddenly. I'm thinking, man, Holy Spirit, will you bring more suddenlies in my life? Things that I weren't, things that I wasn't expecting, things that maybe I, I wasn't even praying about, things that I certainly hadn't planned for, that was Paul. He hadn't planned to go blind for three days. He hadn't planned to have an encounter with Jesus himself. But I'm thankful that God is much bigger than you and I, you all. And so right then, Jesus spoke to him. His followers dragged him into 
back into town in Damascus, the very place where he was going to kill people was the very place that he ran into, if you remember, he ran into a man that Jesus said, the Holy Spirit had said, go, Ananias. He said, Ananias, you're going to find this, this boneheaded, hard-headed, murderous person, but man, he's got so much more on the inside of him. Don't get confused by what you see on the outside. Don't get confused by his reputation. Don't get confused by his LinkedIn on, 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 on what it says, but know this, that I have a plan and a purpose for him. So go talk to him. In fact, I don't want you just to talk to him. I want you to go lay hands on that man. <laughs> Can you imagine what's going through Anna and I? Excuse me? You want me to lay hands on the very man that wants to kill me? Yep. You got to know it's the Holy Spirit, y'all. If not, you're going to get the snot beat out of you. Amen? And so he did. He did. He walked right into that room. He laid hands. He spoke, he spoke revelation. He spoke identity. He spoke future. He spoke promise. Hey, can we have a room full of believers this morning that no matter what you see in the natural over your, over your, your, your kids, your grandkids, your job, your church, your home, the people that you do life, can we have a bunch of people in here that just speak words of faith, that call those things that are not as though they are? If we spend more people, if we spend more time declaring what that young person will be rather than who they are, I'm telling you, we can change the world, y'all. Amen? So that's exactly what Ananias did. He laid hands on Paul. He spoke truth. He spoke life. He spoke identity. He spoke mission. He spoke mission. And then that last part of Acts, everything shifted. Everything changed. Paul or Saul eventually came into, called Paul, who we're going to talk about this morning. Man, he went on mission, and he was all in. Just as much as he was all in for all things against the, against the gospel, against the good news, against Christians, against, against Jesus followers, he was all in the other way. Man, once he got converted, he had no doubt, no worry. He didn't second guess. I have been converted. I have found Christ. Man, if that conviction can rise up on the inside of you and I, I know Christ. And you can't tell me anything different. For you see, Paul went on, his, 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 uh, his list is impressive. He started churches all over the world because he was all in. He traveled thousands of miles preaching the gospel to the lost. He was all in. He endured terrible suffering. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. He was left for dead. He spent many years in a Roman prison just simply for preaching the gospel. He, was, he did that because he preached a God that was all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving. And Paul was all in. Paul wrote at least 13 books in the New Testament. He was all in. And I believe that Paul was one of the greatest men other than obviously Jesus himself who ever walked planet earth. Why? He was all in. Come on, go to Acts 20. The time I have with you this morning, I want to pull out six. There's probably a whole lot more, but just for the sake of time, I wanted to pull out what I'm calling six salty values that you and I can apply in our life that Paul had. Six salty values, things that, that the life of Paul was marked by, that, 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 that jumps out of scripture like never before. And I wanna read in this, in this passage in Acts 20, verse 19. I wanna capture these six values found in here. It says, I served the Lord, are you guys with me? All right. I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, verse 22, compelled by the Spirit, 
I'm going to, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. How'd you like to be on that trip planner right there? Everywhere you go, everywhere you plan, it's not going to be good. <laughs> Verse 24, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race, complete the task of the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among, I, now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. Verse 27, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I have never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit to you, God, into the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. Last verse. In everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That's Paul's farewell speech to, the, to this church in Ephesus. This is his, his farewell speech of, of his life, his, his legacy over the last few years. So here would be my question to us as a house, to you as a, a man or a woman, whoever's listening to this sermon this morning, what would be your farewell speech? What would be the things that you would include in your farewell speech, I mentioned I pulled out six salty values out of this speech that I want to bring to life to you. These are in no particular order, but I, I want to uh, just highlight a few verses. So the first one I want you to write down that Paul um, really pulled out. He said, I made sure, number one, I made sure my generation knew the truth. And this is where this comes to life in verse 20. It said, you know that I've not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but I've taught you publicly and from house to house. For you see, Paul, um, Paul had that conversion, the, the gospel um, encounter on that Damascus road. And then when he shifted, he knew that there were, his time would be limited. He knew because the same, the same, um, uh, the same torture, the same uh, persecution that he was issuing out of his hands would be the same persecution that he would receive. But he had, this, he had this, this conviction on the inside of him that the gospel must be preached. And it must be the whole gospel. It can't be just the gospel of grace, although that's good. It can't just be the, the, the gospel of love. It has to be the full gospel. The gospel about the, the death and the resurrection, amen? It has to be about the shed blood of Christ. It has to be about the full gospel preached and he knew that and so it, it, it he knew that as part of as part of preaching this that he would encounter he would encounter all sorts of pushback he would encounter all sorts of rebellion he would encounter all sorts of persecution but the truth on that verse was I must preach the full gospel hey listen as a house we have to preach the full gospel And see, it's, it's not comfortable sometimes for the church to confront 
things around sin. It's not comfortable for us as a church or um, for us to confront things around, um, ar- ar- around habits and around things that don't line up to the word of God. It's much easier for me to pacify and, and give you goosebumps and sing kumbaya, but that's not the gospel, y'all. Although that's a part of it, don't get me wrong. But we also have to, there has to be a conversion that happens on the inside of our soul. The only way that happens is if we preach the judgment of God. Well, that doesn't sound very encouraging. Yeah, but we serve a just God. We serve a God that, that does care about your living, about your walking, about your talking, about your serving. He does care about what you're putting in your body. He does care about the, the things that you surround yourself with. He cares about the things that you're putting in your ears. He's a just God. He gives us the Holy Spirit. It's just that you and I don't want to listen to it sometimes. Why? Because we're comfortable in our mess. But Paul knew that. Paul knew that he had to preach the full gospel, the whole gospel, not just the parts that make you feel good about yourself. Hey, listen, if you walk out the doors this morning and nothing got changed or challenged on the inside of you, I think we've missed the purpose of the full gospel. In a worship, in a worship set, in a, in a message, in the ministry, whatever part, even in a hug, even in the, even the embrace of, of someone that you've never met before, there is something that happens when you and I, when we preach the full gospel. Let me tell you how this ha- happens. is when you and I, when we don't necessarily come from the same side of the tracks or the, the same side of the road, when you and I come from different parts, when the, the, uh, the, the color of my skin or, or my education background, or my social background, or my religious background, whatever it may be, when we can come together as one house. That's full gospel, y'all. That's full gospel. That's what Paul was fighting for. So the first thing that he had to contend for, the first thing, the first salty value, if you're, right, if you're taking notes, is that Paul absolutely was committed to preaching the full truth for the people of his generation. The second one, Paul's life pointed people back to Christ back to Jesus himself. It said in verse 19, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. For you see, although Paul was a leader, he was an apostle, he carried the the title, he carried the authority, he had the grace, he was recognized by, by the men and the women around him. Make no mistakes about it, Paul was a servant. Paul served. And because he took his, uh, he took his, his example from Jesus himself, Jesus said, the greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. In other words, you have to walk in humility. Jesus showed us how to walk humbly. I believe in the Bible, the word humility is used something like um, over 200 times in the Bible. Simply put, it's just a, it's simply put, the definition of humility is just the fear of the Lord. And when you and I have a fear of the Lord, we will walk humbly. Because the Bible says he resists, he pushes back on people that get puffed up. Have you ever met somebody that maybe they, um, they recently got a promotion? Maybe they were your peer, and this has happened to me in my, in my, um, my time working at, at Hewlett Packard, where I, I, I worked for many, many years with a set of peers. And uh, we got hired in at the same time. Um, we had the same job description, same responsibilities. Um, but God just made an opportunity for me to get promoted. It's an awkward feeling to manage and to give performance evaluations and to hire and fire and to set salaries and to give feedback and coaching and all the things that go along with being a manager, which, by the way, sometimes that's not a lot of fun. Um, but uh, that, that's, like, that's like, you know, somebody says, oh, I can't wait to be a business owner. Oh, I can't wait to have employees. Oh, I can't wait. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Be careful what you ask for. Am I right, Jeff? Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> right? 
But it's, it's difficult when you have, um, it can be difficult when you have peers that were once your peers and now you're, now, now you're their manager, amen? It's just an awkward, it's an awkward dynamic there. But I, this is how, I, this is the only way that I know how to lead, I serve. In other words, I don't puff out my chest and, and wear my title or my hat CEO or, or whatever, whatever the title. I, I, I don't flaunt my title. Um, I, I, I didn't, I won't, I, I won't until I, got, I, I take my last breath. But what I will do, I will serve. Because I believe that is the heart of God. If we serve one another, I don't have to, I don't have to push my way in and, and show off my fancy business card. All I have to do is serve you. Can I have an amen, church? One of the values of our house is that we are a serving church. In other words, I won't, my wife and I won't ask you to do anything that I won't do myself. Why? Because we are a servant leadership house. We lead by serving. You lead by serving. Well, I can't do that. Well, why can't you? It's your house. Right? And so Paul grabbed a hold of this truth. That he served, the Bible said, and he did it with humility. Can I just put a fork in something? That being humble has nothing to do with being weak. I've heard that before. Yeah, because you're, you, because you're humble and you don't, you don't kind of, um, you know, Chris and I talk about this. Uh, he's a CEO of a very successful company. And, you know, that th there's this misnomer that somehow I got to ramrod over my people I got to somehow impose my will on people in order for them to hear me or, or follow me or, or be led. That is, that is a lie from the pit of hell. I can walk and lead humbly and still walk in authority. Are you guys with me? As a husband, can I just talk to the husbands? You know, we, we take sometimes this scripture out of, out of context. Well, I am the head of my house. Woman. You're supposed to do what I tell you to do. No, that's actually not what it says. <laughs> Go try that with, in my house and, and uh, it won't work out so well for you. Hey, listen, I believe husbands walk humbly. Wives walk humbly. Are you listening to me? Why? Hey, listen, husbands, if you walk humbly before the Lord, before the Lord, walk humbly before the Lord, not in false humility where you just get trampled on, but walk humbly before the Lord. Can I say it again? Walk humbly before the Lord. Then you know what? Your marriage will be amazing. You, you won't have to lord over your wives. You won't have to lord over your kids. Serve them. Can I have an amen? Serve them. Serve. Serve your wives. Serve your wives. Amen. All the women should just buy me Golden Corral for the next year right now. Sorry, I'm working this one bad over the last few months. So, Rhonda Losty said, I'll take you, but it's only for breakfast. Come on, walk humbly. Paul, Paul understood that, right? Paul understood that he had to preach the whole gospel. Paul also understood that he had to point people back to Christ. For you see, Paul wasn't, um, Paul wasn't looking for the people around him to somehow model their lives after him. Catch this, you guys. Paul was saying, hey, I'm going to walk through some suck. It's a, a, that's Tim's version, right? Trials and tears. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have persecution by the very people that I used to do life with, the Jewish people that used to love me and honor me and respect me. And, oh, Paul, high five, go kill some Christians, right? Those are the same people now that are giving them persecution. But Paul knew that. He said, I don't want you to follow me. I want you to follow Christ. Serve him. Walk in humility. Man, I'm telling you, if we can ever grab a hold of how to serve one another, we will radically change our community. Not about me. Not about Paul. It's about him. Father, we want all the attention to be on you today. Jesus, you're the focus. You're the center. Number three. Salty value, third salty value that Paul said in this passage in Acts 20. He said, I strengthened the church. Hmm. Verse 28, it says, keep watch, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock 
of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. In other words, Paul understood Paul understood the, um, the very heart of Jesus, the very heart of God is the church. It's the church. Who's the church? You and me. Believers. People that have made Christ in them. People that have received Christ on the inside of them. We are the church. That's the very, that's the very group of people that Paul that Paul was willing to, 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 to lay down his life, to be a martyr for the very, the very institution of church. I don't like using that word, but, but it's, 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 this, it's this larger than life. I can't put my hands on the church per se, because you and I are the church. Amen? We can literally have service in the parking lot today and we will still have the presence of God. The Holy Spirit show up. People get saved. People get filled with the Holy Ghost. People get ministered to. It's not about a box, you all. It's about you and I. And Paul just made up his mind that that is the bride and I must protect it. I must, I must, I must do whatever I can to feed it, to strengthen it, to support it. Listen, the church, certainly in the last few years, ours included, has not been immune to taking pot shots or people thinking that their truth or their way or the church is not relevant or, or um, it's not for today or somehow my faith needs to be deconstructed because it was built on something other than what the Bible says. Hey, listen, all that very well may be true in some cases, but this is what I do know is that the church, even on its worst day, is still the best thing going. Hello? But it doesn't give us a license to be sloppy. It doesn't give us a license not to love. It doesn't give us a license to, or permission to somehow be other than what the Bible says in the full gospel, that we are to love one another and to preach the full gospel. Not some watered down, grace filled, I love you, you love me version. Although that's good. But we're supposed to have standards that are uncompromising, no matter what culture says. Listen, my wife said it a few weeks ago. The message doesn't change. We will never change, neither should you. Collectively as a house, we will never change the message. The gospel is the gospel. But the way that we get it out, the, the, the method in which we, we preach it, we deliver it, we try to get it in front of as many people as possible, that is always changing, always evolving, and it needs to. If we're still preaching the same gospel in the same manner th that we're doing 30, 40, 50 years ago, I think we've missed it. Hello? God is always speaking. There's always revelation. There's always an opportunity to hear a fresh download from the Lord. So that was the third one. Paul strengthened the church. Number four, got a couple more. I was faithful to all that Jesus told me to do. Hmm. That was Paul. Paul's salty value was he was faithful to everything, all that Jesus told him to do to do. Go to verse 23. It says, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. For you see, for Paul, he was on mission. Remember, we talked about being on mission before Christ. Now he found Christ and he's on mission. He's on purpose. And he has absolutely made up his mind on the inside of him, on the inside of his soul, I will be faithful. Regardless, let me say, regardless. Regardless of hardships, trials, persecution, I'm gonna get beaten, I'm gonna get stoned, I may even die but I will be faithful. How many of y'all are that way? That despite 
whatever persecution, despite whatever somebody says about you, your faith is unmovable. God, let us have a house full of women that they're not intimidated by what they see. They're not intimidated by what they get called. They're not intimidated by what their family even says. Lord, let us have a, Lord, let us have a church full of men that they are, they are bold. Whew. They're willing to puff out their chest, walk humbly before the Lord, but they're willing to puff out their chest and do it unto the Lord. Amen? Man, I'm telling you what, if that can get on the inside of you and I to be like Paul, to know that I am on mission, I've been faithful, I've not been knocked off of my course, I will finish. I'll finish. I can't tell you how many young men this week that have been laid on my heart. I've been texting them, <laughs> just like, like, it, 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 the enemy doesn't fight fair. Guys in this house, young men, sitting right here on fire for God, lifting their hands, worshiping, praising, uh, just uh, in their Bible, in their word, having mountaintop experiences. Oh, I'm all, God, I'm, I'm, I'm all in, I'm all in, I'm all in. Poof, gone. Where are you? Where is the faithfulness? that God had to put on the inside of you to stick through the crap. Sorry, sorry, Mama B. Can I use suck instead of, is that any better? Stuff. You and I, will, we, we will walk through stuff in our lives. But Paul knew that. He knew that ahead of where he was going, that he said in that very verse, I may not make it back. In fact, I won't see you again. What? Yeah, I think I'm going to be killed. If you were confronted by that before you came to church, by virtue of you coming to church in this amazing auditorium, sitting in this padded chair, would you still show up that you run the risk of being slaughtered because of your faith? Lift your hands, boom, you die. That's, that's radical. Today. Isn't it interesting, the timing of that? <laughs> I just can't make this stuff up. What would you do if you were faced with being slaughtered just because you pulled into those, that parking spot? Everything changes. The perspective changes, y'all. Paul knew that. He was faithful. Everything that Jesus asked him to do, he was faithful. Can I have, can I have a, uh, I'm going to make a fresh challenge for us as a church. Will you be faithful? Will you be faithful in the little things? Sometimes we want to be faithful in the big things. We want our name in lights. We want some kind of social media posts and look at me and, okay, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, but will you be faithful to open up your Bible this week? Will you be faithful to pray for a neighbor who just lost a loved one? Will you be faithful to pray for me, <laughs> pray over our house? Will you be faithful to share the gospel this week? Those are the little things when no one's really going to applaud you or give you an attaboy or an girl or, hey, great job. Hey, by the way, um, speaking of an attaboy, um, will you give J.D. Rivera, he's back in our house, will you give him a big hand? Half the church is thrown his applause. The other half was like, what's the deal with him? He stayed faithful. Amen. I'll, uh, I'll give the microphone up to him at some point. I want him to tell a story. Not today. Don't even dare. 
But there is something about being faithful, amen? When all the lights, when all the cameras, when all the things aren't on you, will you be faithful? Will you show up when no one else is showing up? Will you sing when no one else is singing? Will you run a soundboard when no one else wants to run the soundboard? Will you show up and fix a toilet even though you're in your three-piece suit? I, I don't think we really do that any longer, but anyhow, you know what I'm saying. Come on, let's go to point number five. I'm going to round this. I'm going to wrap this up. I can keep staying on there. Hey, actually, uh, sorry. Can I just, can I call out a quick scripture? Go to Philippians 4. Before I jump to number, uh, point number five. Go to Philippians 4. Quickly. Verse 11. I just, uh, I want to just speak this over our house. God reminded me of this verse this week in a conversation I had. It says, I'm not saying this because I am in you. This is Paul talking again. So once again, Paul experienced all the, um, all the persecution we talked about earlier. It says, I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content. Underline that word in your Bible. Underline the word content. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. You should underline that word. Whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content. There's that word again. In any and how many situations? Shout it. How many situations? In every and all situations, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in, or, or in want, I can do all things. Hmm. I can do all. I can do all of this. What is this life? Marriage, living, serving, giving. Being a husband, a father, a son, a daughter, a grandma, a gra I can do all of this through who? Through Christ. For he gives me, gives you, he gives you the strength. So in other words, if I am going to be faithful to God, I have to do it in all of this through Christ. If I do it in my strength, I will get worn out, I'll quit. And I'll run. That was a bonus scripture for you all. Chew on that scripture. I'm going to come back on a message this year talking about being content. Come on, verse 5. Or, or uh, number 5. Verse 24, back in Acts. It says, I, this is a six, the fifth salty value that Paul, we can extract out of Paul's life. It says, I finished strong. He said in verse 24, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Listen, I said it earlier that there's a lot of, it's easy to make a decision for Christ. For a lot of people, sometimes even that's a tough decision. The hard part is actually finishing the race of Christ, living for Christ. Are you with me, church? That is, that is what's going to speak volumes to a generation that is lost, is that can there be a man or a woman that's willing to be like Paul and finish strong? Finish strong. Be faithful and finish strong. Did you hear me? Be faithful. Faithful in all through him and finish strong. What does strong look like? Strong looks like this, that at the end of your very last breath, when you are given your farewell speech, you can talk about all of the things that God did to you, God did through you, and God did for you. Amen? I don't know about you, but I, as a house and as a man, as a husband, as a, as a soul, I want to finish strong. I want to finish strong. In other words, I want to preach the full gospel to as many people as I can. I want to see as many people saved. I want to see as many people healed and rescued. I want to see as many people turned into a disciple maker and then preaching the gospel again. That's my heartbeat, y'all. 
If you want to know why, how I'm wired, that is how I'm wired. And along the way, I am going to love on a ton of people. No matter what your size, your shape, your flavor, your background, your color, I don't really care. Why? Because Christ loved me. Who am I to judge you? Are you with me? On August the 5th, we're going out to the fairgrounds. Make sure you put that on your calendar, August the 5th. We're going to go and love on our community. We did it last year for our back-to-school giveaway. And if you weren't here, you just missed probably one of the most amazing things we've ever did as a church. We're going to be partnering with organizations and businesses all over, the, all over this place. And I'm believing God. I don't have the money yet. I'm going to believe God that we're going to give away over 2,000 stuff school backpacks to um, families in need. We're going to feed over 500 families a generous box of food and we're going to give away over 100 haircuts to moms and dads right before back to school starts. Amen? We're going to do it at the Pensacola Fairgrounds. We were there last year. How many of you there, how many of you there came out last year? Good, about half of y'all. So the rest of y'all, get ready. Amen? It's going to be amazing. Put that on your calendar August the 5th. Why? Because I just know that we have to go love people where they're at. They may not come through these doors. So we have to take the gospel to them. That's part of finishing strong, y'all. That's part of us, you and I, finishing strong. So finish. Be steady. Philippians 1 verse 18 says, but what does it matter the important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. Last one. Number six. Six salty value from the life of Paul is this one. I gave more than I took. Write that down. I gave more than I took. In verse 33, it says, I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. And then it goes on to say that everything I did, Paul was talking about this. Everything I did, I gave it, I gave it unto the Lord. I want our lives, I want our house to be marked. Will talked about it earlier. I want our house and us as, as men and as women, I want our house to be marked by generosity. What can I do for you? One of, the, one of the values that Angie and I talk about it often around this, and, and I, I pray it leaps on everybody in the sound of my voice this morning, and here's our heart, is how can I help? How can I help? Wait, 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 I'm supposed to be serving you. I know, but how can I help? How can I help you? See, it just shifts. Jesus said it was, it's, it, it's better to give than to receive, Right? His life modeled everything that was about generosity. So for, for Paul, it was easy for him to see the generosity of Jesus himself. And so his motto, his, his life value was, I want to give more than I take. For you see, I believe it is, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I believe it's I, I, uh, I believe it's the, the value of serving others unlocks the hearts of people that may not receive the gospel. Are you guys with me? There's something about you and I going outside of our comfort zone to love, to serve, to give to people that are less fortunate to us. I don't know about you, but I'm a blessed person. I, I, I don't need a lot. My wife thinks she needs Marshall. She really doesn't. I don't, uh, thank you, David. I, I, don't, I don't need more stuff, yeah. Amen. So in, in, in this season of my life, I'm all about, Lord, how can you use us as a house to give? If we have it, we'll give it away. Amen. Did you hear me? If we have it, we'll give it away. Our prayer, God, if you can get it to us, you can get it through us. Are you guys catching the flavor of this? I'm asked often, hey, tell me about your church. Like, like what are the values? I'm telling you, these are the values of our house. We're going to preach the full gospel. We're going we're gonna to point people back to Jesus, not to Tim or to Ange. We're going um, to serve others, amen. 
We're gonna do it faithfully. We're gonna finish strong. And then we're gonna give. We're gonna be a giving house like never before. Here's, here's the truth as we wrap up this morning. <laughs> I believe in this season today, as I'm, as I'm looking around this auditorium this morning, I'm overwhelmed by the grace of God and the goodness of God. People that it's unusual for you to be here. It's supernatural for you to be here. But somehow God has made a way, made an opportunity. Before you knew it, I believe that God had planted you in this house. We've been calling you in. We've been praying you in. Your gifts, your talents, your heart, your stories. We've been praying you in. And I believe it's not, it, this, this season in our house and this season in culture, quite frankly, when, as, as, we, st as we step in, I'm starting, and, and forgive me, as we step into some of the political stuff again, oh, it just gives me, oh, it, it just gives me heartburn thinking about all the political acrimony and the division and, and all the nuttiness that, that comes along with it. But I just been praying, I just said, God, if we'll just stay true to the values that made Saul, Paul, that made Paul salty, if we'll just love people, if we'll preach the full gospel, if we'll be faithful, if we'll finish strong, God, if we'll point people back to Christ and not back to the Democrats or the Republicans or, or whatever other political, if we'll just point people back to Christ, we're gonna be okay. Amen? Listen, young people, we have, we have a, um, there is a priority on, on the young. That's why I'm excited about a, a whole group of kids camp, uh, young people going, because I believe that is the generation that we must make sure that we're living the values as moms, as dads. Hey, listen, if my daughter, if the only time she ever hears me talking about the Lord, praying, opening my Bible, worshiping, if the only time she ever sees me doing that is on Sunday morning, that's a problem. Are you hearing me? That's a problem. How do I ever expect my daughters to grab a hold of these values unless I am doing them, showing them? Come on, let us have a church full of men and women that are not afraid to show the love of God, what faithfulness looks like. Let's have a church that's chucked that finishes strong, that doesn't fall apart, steady. Let's have a church that puts Christ first. Stand to your feet, church. Thank you, Father. Six salty values. I made sure my generation knew the truth. I pointed people back to Christ. I strengthened the church. I was faithful to all that Jesus told me to do. I finished strong. And I gave more than I took. Somebody shout all in. Come on, everybody, shout all in. Do you want to know what all in looks like? What is the definition of all in? That's the definition. Those six values, you as a believer, you as a man, as a woman, those are six values. If, if, if you grab a hold of those values, that, that to me and to everyone around you, you're all in. You're salty. Somebody shout salty. I don't know about you, but I want to be a salty church. I want to be a salty church to a dying world. I want to be a salty church to, a, to, a, uh, to the big C church at times that lo that's looking like it's losing its saltiness. I can't control what the rest of the churches do. But as for our house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be a salty house. We're going we're gonna to pattern our lives after these values. Last verse, Philippians 3 says, but whatever we, but whatever were gains to me, this is Paul talking as he's wrapping up his life, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ.
What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing that Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. In other words, I may have lost everything in the world, but I've gained Christ. I've gained the treasure of knowing Jesus. Come on, with your eyes.